Hi everybody, my name is Danica Joan and welcome to Custody Matters Live with my lovely host, Caroline. Welcome, so glad to see you again. Hey, How's it going? Hope everyone's doing well. How you doing Danica? I am doing great. It's just been a good week. It's been a very good week because um, yeah. Yeah. I got Oh yeah, so we can't forget about that. That was perfect. Like we were supposed to get a visit and she gets engaged anyway. <laughs> yeah. I love that. <laughs> Congratulations, it's so exciting. Thank you. You know, it's been amazing because um, it's just been an amazing ride for the last year and a half. Um, just actually, you know, this, this will be my third marriage. And what I get is even, even the relationships that did not, that were not marriages and stuff like that, there was a certain pattern that mm -hmm. I had. Um, and I got that, that um, some were not so healthy. And finally, finally, it's, uh, I was talking to somebody and they said, well, was it your age that had you finally get into the right fit or whatever? And I said, well, the thing is, is I think I stopped attracting the unhealthy fit. So yeah, it was your age because it was wisdom. You learned what not to do and what you wanted as opposed to what happened. And you knew with this one, you're not going to do that again. Am, am I close? <laughs> well, and um, kind of, I think part of it is the thing, and, and it's true. You've got to, got to see what you don't want. Mm -hmm. And then it, then what you do want starts getting defined. That being said, how many times have we have many of us here, we've, we've married somebody or we've gotten into a significant relationship and then that didn't work out. So I am going to pick somebody who's not that. I'm going to pick some, if they were very religious, then we, the next one we go to, we're like, I don't want anybody who's religious. Mm -hmm. or if they were, you know, whatever. Um, I know that it's not necessarily, um, and that's kind of a trap that you find yourself in because the thing is, is if you think that you're attracting, you're going after something that's the opposite of what you didn't like, it, if you're looking for it out here, you're gonna find that you got into the relationship with the same person with a different face. Mm -hmm. Because what's going to show up is the similar, the similar things that you're attracting. Because whatever's inside of you that hasn't been worked out or whatever is awesome. going to, um, that's where the inner work has to be done. For right. you to start attracting a healthy relationship. Yeah, and you know what? What's really interesting is people all the time tell people to make a list of what they want in another person and just put the list away. Well, the key that I learned from doing that is as I was writing the list, I was looking, I'm like, wait a minute, that's me, that's me, that's me, that's me, that's me. So when you said that about, you know, when you become who you are, you're going to attract the same person that's going to come, that will come to you. So the more you heal and the more you become the person that you want to be, you, you attract that person at the same level rather than, you know, if you're in fear, you're going to attract someone who's going to scare you. You're going to attract some, attract someone who, who puts you in a place of fear all the time. And, and that's a good, that's a good, uh, a good way to, to look at doing that list and just saying, Hey, that's me. You know, I mean, my list is probably way different right now than it was three years ago when I did the last one. Not that I, I would need say to. for me, I, I was very codependent. Mm -hmm. um, I found my value of, in, in being of service to other people because somehow, somehow I got the lesson when I was young that um, it was selfish to, you know, if you have two hands, two arms, that means you have one and you have a spare one to give away. You know, and that's, I know it's an absurd analogy, but that, but I think all of those people who may be able to relate to that, who've been codependent, you, um, you it's like, it's like there's something inside of you that says, I must give a part of myself away to this person so that I feel like, like 
valued or valuable or whatever. And, um, and, and if I don't, then I'm just being selfish. So that's like the meaning that we put to, to all of that. And, um, you know, not to, there's a lot of value in, um, in, in the churches and stuff like that. But it was my, it was my own personal experience of going, of growing up in the church. That was the same thing is, um, I am nothing. I am not, you know, I am to be, to be a good Christian wife. I have to be, you know, this doormat. Mm -hmm. And I get that. It's not, not like that. I'm not saying that it's that religion is across the board like that, but that was my experience of me not valuing myself. So when I started getting healed from that and realizing I'm not selfish because I don't, give away everything, all my resources and everything I have, um, I started attracting somebody different. And interestingly, I thought I also, when I was um, creating the criteria for somebody, I was, when I was ready for someone to come into my life, I also set up a standard. Um, a lot of times that we get into, we like, well, I really am lonely. I want to find somebody and where can I find somebody else? go to the church, or I'll go to the bar, I'll go to the beach, or, or I'll mingle with friends, and I'll ask friends to hook me up, and stuff like that, and it's like, would, um, I kind of see it as um, a job vacancy, mm. Consider in the context of um, those of us who have businesses, and we're desperately needing an assistant, or we definitely need a certain person um, in our organization, do we just go to a bar, go to a beach, go to hey, mingle with friends to find somebody and then try to hope to, to mold them into the, the tasks that we need? Mm -hmm. Or do we write a list and say, well, you know, I need this person to be a um, very prolific writer. They have to be good in math. They have to have da-da-da-da-da. No, we, we think nothing of writing a, a job description to attract the perfect person for that vacancy. And why aren't we doing that in the dating world where we're creating a criteria for, because the thing is, is when we write the criteria, we're very specific in, uh, so if we're specific, now we know what doesn't fit. Mm -hmm. And we're not blinded by their adorable eyes <laughs> and, you know, and all that. We're like, mm does this person meet my criteria? Mm -hmm. so. And sometimes you got to, I mean, after the first couple of times where you mess up so bad, you have to be a little more, um, not harsh on yourself, but just like be aware of what you really want for yourself. And, and that kind of, that actually making that list, the most important part of making that list is to surrender it to the universe because that person may not show up next week and you're going to be sitting there going, come on, come on, come on. And you can't, it's not going to happen because when you do that, you get anxious and all that kind of thing. Nothing ever comes to you. When you take a step back and you just say, okay, I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to just go about my business, do my thing and surrender. I surrender. Bring me the guy. You got this, whatever, however you look at that, whether you have, you know, whatever your higher power, your higher self, whatever that looks like, but surrender is the most important component <laughs> to that list. Surrender. As opposed to, I would say in a way, opposite of surrender is attached. Mm -hmm. You're attached to the outcome mm -hmm. or you're surrendering to to be with the outcome coming to you and whatever the outcome is and being okay with what it is. So when you, if you're so specific yeah. that you're never, you're never going to find that person, that job would, I mean, you got to be specific to a point, but you got to leave a generality like uh, Abraham Hicks. They always talk about that. Make it general. You can be specific in what you want, but make the expectation general, mm -hmm. you know? So that way you will, something shows up that's better, this or this or something better, you know, then you've got like, oh my God, this is great, you know, so then you've got that. So, um, yeah, I mean, surrendering, I, I have to, I'm not going to, 
I don't know how to bring this out. Like I had an experience and I'm not going to be specific about it unless you want to talk about your experience with surrender. Um, with what we talked about earlier, I can talk about mine in vague terms. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, yeah. And, and what Caroline and I are talking about, a lot of times we have these conversations about our family or people we know, obviously that, um, that generate these ideas. So, mm -hmm. so yeah, like, triggers things that we're attached to um that create triggers it mm -hmm. really is about um it's not out there that's the thing is a lot of times people think that they that the um if so and so would just you know stop being late they're always later if so and so would would just you know do something different or be something different then my life will be wonderful and, uh -huh. uh, and a lot of times we like to i call it kill off relationships that too um a lot of times we were like you know what this person is out of my i know how to make my life blissful i will cut this person out and that person out and that person out and then, and then you know this is the crazy thing it's like playing whack-a-mole uh -huh. um with with people and um, the thing is, is and then there's another mole that pops up. It's just like the person that you just, you handled, you got them out of your life. Mm -hmm. But so the key is, it's not out there mm -hmm. that we have to, that we have work to be done. It's us because they're not getting triggered. We're getting triggered. We're getting attached to something. Um, we're hanging on tight. Like it's gotta look a certain way. Mm -hmm. And, and so the big question is, how do you get out of that situation? How do you get out of those feelings of like, you know, I mean, for me, getting rid of everybody in my life made me isolated and alone. So I'm not whack a mole one person and getting another person the same. I'm already doing that. But then at the same time, I'm getting this, this isolation. I don't want those things to happen either. Most people want to um, give and receive love. I mean, that's their biggest thing. Everybody wants to be loved. Everybody wants to share everybody for the most part. I mean, I don't want to generalize. So what I'm, what I'm kind of bringing, bringing out is like, how do you get through that? You know, I mean, like with, with, I'm not, again, I'm not going to go into detail, but for me, um, and I'd love to hear how, how you do it too, obviously. I'm sure everybody else would like to know. Um, when I get into a situation at this point in my life, this has not been forever. This is pretty much uh, within the last year or two. Um, I found two tools that really, really helped me to not feel so out of control with everything that's happening with that trigger that happened outside of me and, and being able to step through that and go to the next, next thing to get, you know, to feel better. And one of those, one of those tools um, was gratitude. And just, I mean, you don't have to sit there and come up with all these, I'm grateful for um, this amazing household, whatever, whatever. You don't have to do that. You can do something as simple as thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, and you don't even have to believe it initially. You just say it and it just starts to ingrain your, your, your ego is going to fight you because it doesn't want to be grateful. You want to be grateful. And that helps you move into a space of um, being able to surrender, you know, because gratitude just kind of changes your energy. It's like, oh, wow, thank you so much for that beautiful sunshine out there. Isn't that cool? Or getting up in the morning. Oh, my God, I can breathe. <laughs> you know, that's a good thing to be grateful for. So those are just some examples. I don't know, Danica, do you have any ideas on, on, on that? So, you know, you're right. And it is important that it be authentic too. Um, and there are times when you, if you just acknowledge that I am really pissed off and I'm really triggered by this today and, and this is not working, just sort of like saying, okay, now I've got that out of my system. Now from there, what can I be grateful for and, um, and really be authentic about the small things. And sometimes when you're in your, the dark night of the soul, you have to find um, even the little things mm -hmm. to say, you know what? I am grateful that I have my health. 
I'm grateful that my lights are on at this very moment, even though I know this afternoon they're coming to turn them off. I can be grateful for the, like the little tiny things. Right. And, um, because that's those little baby steps that are going to get you to where you need to be. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And then, and then also like with those baby steps, as you move into surrendering and understanding how to surrender, um, there's a couple of things that really, really like I'll, I'd, I'd like for you to describe the one that you had mentioned when we were talking earlier, um, was, um, the unhook. I think that's yes. really interesting because I've done that before and how you explained it was exactly because I was like, oh yeah, 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 yeah. Cause I remember doing that. I did it with my mother. So if you could yeah. kind of give a, uh, that description of unhooking so you can surrender. Yeah, um, you know, unhooking from it when you are um, when you're triggered, just something just really uh, triggers you about somebody or a relationship, and maybe that other person. And I'm sure a lot of you watching here can can identify with this that there is a person, a toxic person in your life that you don't choose for them to be in your life. They may be an ex spouse, they may be a child, they may be a parent um, that knows your buttons. Mm -hmm. And they've lived their whole life using that strategy or that strong suit or whatever to, to get a rise out of people to, or, and, and that's their payoff. You really have to, uh, the work again, it's in, inside of you because not everybody is triggered by whatever it is this person does. Um, believe it or not, this person has people who really like them. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And it doesn't see that person the way that you see them. So ultimately it's the way that you handle things. And part of what helps me is to imagine that person as their, as the five-year-old, what would that, what did they go through that had them be so toxic? What kind of childhood did they have or of being a five-year-old? Cause we know from the, the experts, that like a toxic narcissist is created from an upbringing of, of no love, mm -hmm. no true unconditional love. Yeah. Yeah. And also, I mean, if a, if a toxic narcissist is talking to you in a certain way or says certain words or whatever that is, they're replicating the words that they heard mm -hmm. when they grew up. So, you know, um, hurt people, hurt people. I think, um, uh, AA says that I can't remember who who does, but a lot of people recognize that. But um, yeah, so they could have gone through something horrific, and they're listening to this parent like degrade and demean them and all this stuff, and that's what they know. That's what they're used to. So they come at you, and you didn't do anything. You don't deserve it. But that's all they know. That's their protective mechanism for themselves, and so they come at you. So how do you? surrender into that moment and unhook from that person and to get yourself centered again recognizing that that person has been hurt as well and and it's almost like like i've had to do it and i and, and danica and i have kind of related on this it's like you almost have to um see them it's an empath um, empathy that you see them in yourself it's like well how was i hurt that way what did that feel like for me and and that will help you to learn how to unhook and see that person as a, as a young child being affected by that. And you can do that in any circumstance. You can do it at work. You can do that with, you know, ex-spouses. You can do it with your children, even though they're already in that five-year-old state. You know, it's like they don't understand. So how do I empathize with them? You know, so. Yeah, you know, and there's a certain part of it, especially if there's still an attachment or, or maybe an something inside of you that feels like you're not good enough or deserving or whatever, if there's still something that needs to be healed within you, um, that can be very difficult to, to be af afraid to be vulnerable to mm -hmm. seeing them as human, as seeing them <laughs> as <laughs> uh -huh. a child, yeah. right? Yeah. Because all you see is that 
you just see anger and mean and liar and all this stuff in front of you. And it's like, I don't know what to do with this. Okay, so here's your opportunity. Everything's an opportunity. Life is not happening to you. It's happening for you. You know, keep those things in your head. That is some, that's some of the stuff that, you know, I, I work through. And, you know, I was going to mention before you unhook, there is another tactic where you just take a step back and just take a deep breath. Yes. And then and observe what's happening to you and feel it in your body. Where does it hurt you in your body? Like, is your back hurting? Is your stomach starting to hurt? Whatever that is, you know, if your body is starting to hurt, then you're starting to pick up on a feeling that you've held for, for many, 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 many years. And just being, having the opportunity to let go of that because you don't need it. It's not necessary to have that energy in you anymore. So breathing is huge. <laughs> That's, I'm not going to repeat that more often than you want to hear, but it, it needs to be said. So, um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, yes, yes. So let's see here. So a takeaway would be to, um, uh, let's see, surrender. Surrender versus be attached to an outcome. Mm -hmm. Surrender to how the outcome will unfold. Um, and um, definitely build your gratitude muscle. Mm -hmm. Yep. Grateful for the tiny little things that, yep. um, and because I think that if you have a practice of gratitude every single day, you, you know, just like you eat breakfast or whatever you do first thing in the morning, if, if you're grateful for something, you'll find that it grows. Your gratitude gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Yeah. And, and I and found then, before you go to bed too. Yes. What that does is it sets you up for a night of actually sleeping. When you feel grateful, you can, you're not thinking about all the garbage. You're thinking about what you're grateful for. So when you wake up in the morning, you're not like, you're, you know, I'm starting all over again. It's not, you know, whatever. So I'm sorry. I just wanted to add that in there. <laughs> and I think that, you know, like um, in many of the religions of the world, you know, we wake up, we do our morning prayers and we do our evening prayers and we pray after each meal. I think part of that practice, aside from the religious aspect, part of that practice is these are built in opportunities to be thankful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's, that's, that's good point even though i mean because i used to run away from all that stuff and until you said that i was like wait a minute yeah i guess that's true <laughs> you know because i i just couldn't handle it um and the last one i wanted to recommend too is there's a book out there by michael i think his middle initial is a singer s-i-n-g-e-r and it's called the surrender experiment and for those of you who know about him, he also wrote The Untethered Soul, which was really popular. Um, this one was huge in helping me. He gave uh, examples of different things that came up in his life of things that he had to surrender to because he had no choice and how he got through it and how it made him stronger and how it made him be able to do it with everything in his life. So I would highly, highly recommend that book. Um, it's really powerful. So... I think that's so, <laughs> I guess I, I, what I would like to leave you with is to look at how you are the source and how you can gain your power back. If you knew that whatever's happening out there is whatever's happening out there, it's like there's a, um, you know, here in Florida, we get hurricanes and we hear the wind blowing and the rain and stuff like that. We can't control the wind and the rain. Um, but we can control what's going on in the side of our house. And, um, and uh, we in Florida, many times, we have hurricane parties on the porch. <laughs> 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 that, unless we're evacuated. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, so. Good news, the house I live in now, is rock solid, has been here since 1973. So the way he built it was intentional to hurricanes. So if you want to have a hurricane party on the next one, come on down. <laughs> That's right. So consider that you're the source. Yeah. And oh, don't let anybody rent space in your, or live in your head rent free. Right. And if you're the source, then you create your life 
and you can cr uncreate your life too. You can uncreate all that stuff that you see out there inside. That's right. Yeah. So thank you so much for joining us for another Custody Matters Live with Caroline Rena and Danica Joan. We will see you again next week.